Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this uh, Friday night interview program. And tonight I have with me Angel Martin. And uh, it, we're running a little bit behind because of technical problems. So we're going to have to conduct this uh, interview the old fashioned way. Okay. When did, when did we ever think that just using a cell phone was old fashioned? But uh, um, Angel was not able to get connected through their regular program. So I have her on my speaker phone, on my cell phone. Uh, Angel, just say hi to everybody and, uh, so we can uh, see if everybody can hear you okay. Hello, everybody. Yeah. Okay. So we have some people in the chat room right now. Hello, Anna and Albert. And uh, I'm sure more will be joining us now that we've gone live. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I, I titled this, um, I don't know if you noticed the title, uh, Angel, but I said, uh, Interview with an Angel. <laughs> now, well, yeah. <laughs> so let, let me ask you off, off the bat is, you know, a lot of us use, uh, use names, uh, but is, is, yeah. is Angel, is, your, is that your actual name, Angel? Yes, it is. Okay. Angel, yeah, my dad. Uh, something came over him when I was born, and he decided out of nowhere to name me Angel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my mom wanted to be Monica. I'm glad it was Angel, because that would have been bad when Monica Lewinsky happened. Ah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, that's not a, not a name you want to be associated with anymore, Monica. But uh, personally... Yeah, usually is like a stripper name or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, they don't usually name, they don't usually name strippers uh, Angel, I don't think. I don't know of any. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, I personally think that uh, everybody ought to have a name from the Bible. My name's mm -hmm. Luke. Angel is in the it. Bible. and But all these people that we know and love, a lot of them, their name's not in the Bible. And I keep on saying, why didn't they give you a Bible name like us? <laughs> well, no, I love Luke's one of my favorite names, actually. But uh, I guess you could say my first daughter had a, has a biblical name, uh, kind of. Uh, but it's very unfortunate in certain ways. I love it. But it's a version of Luke. Uh, it's Lucien. Oh, Lucien. Lucien, yeah. It's like a version of Lucien. Yeah, I've had people try to tell me I should change it. I'm like, that's, first of all, that's ridiculous because he doesn't get to own that name, you know, even though maybe he does. But uh, uh, it, this means the light bearer. I was a unbeliever, a, like a nasty unbeliever when I when she was born. But uh, yeah, I just thought it was my favorite name for a long time. But I love Luke. I like all variants of that name. It's a it's a curse, I guess, yeah. but I think it's a beautiful name. Thank it means you. the same as Luke. Thank you. I. Um... <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm gonna. I don't know if you've seen uh, or listened to any of the prior interviews, uh, but I'm going to. I'm going to ask you a, a series of questions to try to get to know you better, not just for my benefit, but for the benefit of our whole congregation. And uh, if I ask you something that you prefer not to talk about, uh, or or you'd like to just cut it short, don't worry. I, I, if I'm probing too much, it's okay to say no. to move on. Thank okay. you. I love your interviews. I know that yeah. that's almost impossible with me. So. All right. Okay. So, Angel, uh, I I think that you're a fairly young woman. If you don't mind, maybe it be is rude to ask a, a, a woman her too age. Too far. Too far. Ah. I'm, I'm 32. Okay. I'm, 30. I'm almost 33. I'll be 33 on the 15th of February. Luper Kelia. Yes. Okay. So, th 33 years old very soon. And... Uh, yeah, so you are an adult. You're all grown up. You're not a child, but to me, you're still a, a youngster. <laughs> well, that's flattering. Have you no idea? I'm like, I'm like, eat that up. Yeah, just keep telling me how young I am, please. I'm, I'm feeling old. Every time I don't get carded, I'm like, it's all over. Uh, <laughs> all right, well, let's let's start at the at the beginning. Uh, if you. Um, so almost 33 years ago, you were born, uh, and where was where was that that you were born and grew up? I was born in uh, Key West, Florida. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, it's like a little tiny tip of islands, a string of islands at the tip of Florida, uh, closer to Cuba than it is Miami. Um, yeah, I was born and raised there until I was about 18, and uh, moved. On graduation day, we moved. <laughs> That's, I, that's very interesting because uh, after I finished college in 74, uh, I moved to uh, Florida. 
uh, for my wow. for my job, and I, I traveled from uh, Fort Pierce to Key West all the time in my work. And so I, I do, like it? yeah, I, I did like the keys. They were interesting, but the, to me, the only key that really is was significant enough to even think about is a good place to live would be Key West. The other keys, there's nothing, yeah. nothing to them. into a subject that I love, but uh, we'll avoid that for, maybe we'll talk about that at some point in, in this discussion here. Um, uh, let me ask, I want to ask the chat room here first, uh, how your audio is coming since I'm, I'm putting your, uh, my cell phone near my microphone. Uh, can anybody in the chat room just let me know, make a little comment here, tell me if you can hear Angel, if it's okay, the, the audio. Uh, and, but Angel, um, so you were born in Key West, uh, and, and, and how long did you live there? Um, um, well, I, I mean, I, I moved when I was 18 with my family um, to Sarasota, uh, uh, Florida, Bray like around Bradenton. And, um, uh, but I came back actually, so like, uh, I was homesick somehow, and I actually, I lived there on and off until 24, 25. Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Uh, what it was? What is uh? Is Key West? Now I haven't been there since 1975. So uh, yeah. yeah. Is it how? What is the population now? Is, is it would you consider it a city or is it still like a little tiny town? Yeah. It's a residential, like an actual residential population is very small. Uh, the, there's tons of tourists there every day. I'm surprised it doesn't sink uh, from all the people that come. But um, uh, yeah, my class was very small. Like I went to the same school from K to K through eighth grade. To the same kids, actually, you know, from preschool to eighth grade, um, and then we only had like 150 kids in my class. And then when, um, like, in my particular year, and then high school, there's only two high schools, but one was like like an hour the other way in Marathon, like in Marathon Key. And then Key West High School was the only high school for the little kids. So then maybe I had maybe like, I don't know, 200, 250 kids in that in my class, my graduating class. I mean, it was it was small. We all knew each other pretty much, especially before high school. Knew every everybody, um, every single person. So I never knew what it was like not to know everybody. I thought that would be interesting to go to live somewhere where you didn't know everybody. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, well, but the lower keys is not even like Key West. I mean, you saw it like it looks like there's nothing there. So you can imagine how. It, it, like the kids that are living in between Key West and, uh, you know, Key Largo, you know, it's a real isolated population. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. So it wasn't, uh, you didn't grow up in a, like a real big city kind of atmosphere like many people we know. It still yeah. it was kind of a quaint. Uh, who was the famous writer that was famous for living on Key West? Hemingway. Yeah. Hemingway, Hemingway and his cats, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I thought nobody had ever heard of the Key, of Key West growing up. Yeah, it was like, I thought, I mean, it, it, when I look back, I know I realize it's kind of, a, I mean, it's definitely bigger than where I live now. I live out in the country in Indiana. But uh, at the time, you know, yeah, I mean, it felt like not a real place. I just remember thinking, it's not, not even a real place. We don't even have trees. We have mangroves, you know, like, yeah, so I, it, I always wanted to go to the big city. I always thought cities would be so awesome. And I, I liked them when I visited on field trips like New York, but I hate them now. I do anything, never true. So I really don't like the city. So, yeah, and I, but I, you know, I don't even like the keys now when I think back, but that's for other reasons. But, you know, if yeah. it weren't for certain ass reasons, uh, the keys would be, you know, they're really beautiful. But it's a real bad environment to grow up in in terms of the debauchery and the, the spirit 
that you know whatever kind of principalities reside over that yeah. area it's just they're not good yeah. you know it's, I don't it's know. like little san francisco yeah i don't i don't know about it uh, really current um current i mean in the days that i was there it didn't have this reputation, but does have a reputation yeah. of being a, a kind of a sanctuary or a, a haven for homosexual communities. Yeah, that UK before Fantasy Fest started, I believe. I think they started in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, and that's just like a Mardi Gras, but I think even worse. I mean, people just make naked and stuff. I mean, it gets worse every year. But yeah, I mean, it's not a gay pride, pride parade per se, but it might as well be it's the thing. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, total, yeah, I, I, that's what I said, that's way. Uh, I, I never, I could never be an actual homophobe because, you know, I grew up perfectly acclimated to gay people. I mean, now it's different, you know, now I, you know, I recognize that it's a sin, um, you know, and a pretty grievous sin at that. It's, it's really bad because you identify yourself as that sin. It's not, you know, the sin itself, but the fact that people are, t- are brainwashing us thinking that they, I, it's like, I am gay. It's like saying I am blasphemy or so, you know what I mean? Like, it's not that I, I have this sin. It's like, this is who I am. The sin is who I am. Right. So yeah. that's, the, that's the devastating part about it. But yeah, yeah it's very, uh, it's very flamboyant. I've gay said, commissioners. I've, uh, I've talked about this a few times over uh, these uh, public broadcasts about uh, my brother, my older brother, I was one of the very first people to die from AIDS uh, when, it, when it first became uh, known. And uh, uh, so, but, but, but my family, because of my brother, uh, we, we, of course, loved him and accepted him. And, and so we developed a kind of a liberal uh, attitude towards that. But after I got yeah. saved, uh, I, I did have to just say, look, it's, um, it doesn't change my love for my brother, but I still cannot uh, right. accept it as, as, a, as a natural, uh, normal way of life that's, that is, it should be condoned. Um, I mean, did you feel that way of life had anything to do with, like, like did he have, like, a hard party in life, you know, that, uh, or is he just, just gay, but, like, like, other than that, like, pretty low-key guy? Well, yeah, he had he had a relationship with a, a few people that were long-term relationships, but I'm sure he had a period as uh, most people do uh, in that community, and, and yeah. even in my in my time of uh, being heterosexual, uh, in the yeah. in the sixties and seventies, we my generation we were known for being promiscuous, you know, sex, drugs, well, and rock and roll. That's not what I meant so much. Uh, the reason, okay, see, I, I guess I should tell you, my mom was diagnosed with HIV when I was, uh, let's see, eight. Yeah, uh, she tested HIV positive when she was pregnant with my little brother. Um, and uh, I have quite a str- I have quite strong feelings about that whole industry and like how all that works. And she died. She died from the medication 20 years later when I was 28. Uh, uh, so um, I have some pr- I had some pretty big revelations about that whole thing. I mean, I I used to threaten her that if she didn't take her medication, I wouldn't speak to her. So it took. A- I-, I was a virology. I originally was but my biology major in college uh, with a focus on virology. Specifically, you know, because I loved how I loved epidemiology so much, believed in all that stuff, mm. and I have very strong opinions about, uh, you know, what happened to my mom and what happened to a lot of people. The reason I asked that was not about, I didn't, you know, it wasn't even about the promise studio. I was trying to find out whether or not he um, led a lifestyle that might have run his immune system down, because there's some real interesting information now about about especially the very beginning phase of like when they started identifying AIDS or GRID, you know, gay related yeah. immune deficiency. So that's why I asked, but yeah, it's a, that's a yeah. bit long other story, but I did want to tell you that, uh, I can kind of relate because, uh, technically I lost my mom to AIDS. I mean, that's, you know, but we should never have AIDS, full blown AIDS, but, but you know, um, she had HIV and she died, uh, from an aortic aneurysm, yeah. uh, side effect. Oh, that medication that she's on. So, yeah. another thing we have in common, strange. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it is heartbreaking to have uh, your, I'm sure your mother and, and my, my have to uh, watch them suffer and die in, in, from such a horrible. So, um, yeah. the people are, let's say that they are uh, homophobic or anti homosexuals, and for any reason, uh, uh, I would hope that they'd still have compassion for anybody that's sick. Uh, all right. And Let- my mom was not homosexual, just by the way. She, she 
uh, but she dated a guy who was like a drug addict after mm-hmm. she left my dad, and uh, you know he died of AIDS. So it seemed to make sense. Yeah. Her her, her diagnosis, but uh, he well, he already died of heroin or something like that. But so mm-hmm. that's where we always figured she got it. But um, um, yeah, she wasn't like uh, like didn't really have a fast track lifestyle mm-hmm. other than that. But you know, mm-hmm. um, she's uh, she's pretty self destructive still. But I did not see her suffer. She was that was the weirdest thing was for me. At least, you know, later on in the whole industry of HIV and AIDS, Mm -hmm. they, uh, you know, the I never, she was like never sick. Mm. Um, It was very weird. So it kind of tormented me as a kid, thinking that she was dying somehow. But she didn't seem to be dying. But supposedly, I was supposed to believe she was dying. And yeah, it really messed me up. But she didn't, yeah, until she got, you know, with the the aortic damage. Um, from the blood, high blood pressure that it caused, she was very skinny and, you know, mm-hmm. not a, she, it was, the medication, she made her miserable though. Mm-hmm. I know that. She was horrified by, like, mm-hmm. she begged me not, like, to just understand why she didn't want to take me more, but, um, but yeah, so that was, that was strange. Well, let me, oh, let's that, go that, back to the, the beginning of your life now, okay? Yeah. Thir- almost 33 years ago, born in, in Key, Key West, and uh, was your, your mother married at the time? Did you have a father or a two-parent yes. family? Yes. Yes, and, and uh, my what? mom and dad were married uh, for a year when they had me. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so did, was your father part of the household for very long? Yes, yes, uh, always. Um, actually, he got custody of me um, So uh, when they divorced. So, mm-hmm. uh, uh, yeah, because my mom, like I said, she had that boyfriend, did not look good in court. Plus, mm-hmm. my, my family, my dad said he had a lot of money. So, um and they were worried and sick about me and yeah. they, it was better that they got custody so they i mean you know they always told me i cost forty thousand dollars for them to get custody of me mm-hmm. it was yeah. that hard for a man to get custody you know yeah but, it, um, is. It, it is <laughs> it, it is even today and it's it's easier today than it used to be but uh so you're tell me about your parents did they have any uh r- religious beliefs and did they pass anything on to you okay um both my parents and you know my family, it's been on my dad's side, but my mom's side too. Uh, they were all Christian, um, like Baptist on my mom's side, and like I don't know, Presbyterian was like the answer I got on my dad's side. Uh, from my granny, my grandmother, my dad's mom raised me with him. Um, like you know, she because she uh, my mom was in and out. She was kind of a loose cannon for a while when I was little, um, especially after she lost custody of me. She really drove her insane. So, um, but you know, eventually uh, I was with her every weekend and all summer, um, uh, around by the time I was like seven. Uh, but, uh, yeah, and my mom was, yeah, they were, they were, and I would say tr- like actual believers. Like I always heard the absolute correct gospel as a child. Oh, okay. That's um, good. That's, uh, yeah. you know, uh, that statement there is that's a, that's a, a treasure that you, yeah. you should she'd be so happy about. And very few people oh, yeah. can actually say that their parents actually believe the real gospel. The percentages are so low. And so they right. taught you the real gospel. And I don't know what your position is on, uh, you know, how early a person can believe and be saved. But uh, did, uh-huh. did you, uh, can you remember uh, being taught about uh-huh. Jesus and salvation? And at what age did you think you understood and believed correctly? I didn't, okay, I under, well, I rejected it, like, outspokenly, like, super, like, I was a complete little brat, uh, but from the time I can remember, it was, like, when I was seven, because I got freaked out by the, like, finality of it and the eternality of it, like, I didn't, nobody, they weren't really religious, like, they believed the true gospel, and we went to church when I was real little, like, I remember that that day in church was, like, the last time I remember going was when I, re- like, I just, like, got freaked out and claustrophobic about the whole thing and, like, rejected because I didn't understand. Nobody explained it to me properly. They were like, that's why I say, like, my family were really true believers. Like, they were not, they're like, they were not caught up in works. You know, um, uh, they were, they just had this childlike faith in God. And they understand the, the correct gospel. Um, you know, my granny, you know, would rant about Catholicism, what was wrong with that all the time about the works. You know, but they were not strict, like, they did not flourish religion down my throat. I had no reason to react like I did. Uh, to where I rejected it. Um, I was terrible though. Like I was very precocious and smart and I would try to browbeat everybody out of their faith <laughs> because it, I was frustrated because nobody would explain it to me. Like I really didn't understand. I remember asking them questions like, why did 
did like why did he have to die? Like why wouldn't God just make it all better? Like why mm. didn't why did all this stuff have to happen? Like yeah. why, did that ever know it made any sense to me? And mm-hmm. I was freaked out by the paintings in the church about what heaven mm-hmm. would be like, or what I thought that's what the paintings were about. And there was just like lambs everywhere, and there was like kids in like little like white togo mm-hmm. robe things or whatever. <laughs> it sounds so stupid now, but it just freaked me out when mm-hmm. I was little. Like I was like, wait, so so I, I like, know that you know, uh, that's what heaven is from, from my uh, <laughs> from the experience I have uh, knowing you and listening to you and, and reading your comments. Uh, uh, you're you're very articulate, and I think that uh, I don't know if you've ever been tested, but you seem to be very intelligent. And so I'm wondering, as a as a little as a child, listening to this simplicity of the gospel, and then of course uh, being really intelligent and analytical, and trying and you seeing holes, you saw a lot of holes in it. You were questioning things. What age period did that did that uh, question uh, was that taking place? Seven. That's when I remember the first time it happened. Like in it. I mean, I was, I'm talking like, I was real precocious. I didn't have any kids around me, like out on that beach. I was always surrounded by adults. We had a compound, so, like my family, like my aunts and uncles were always there, you know? So I was always, I had to keep up with grown ups. And yeah, I, when I was tested, like I've been tested twice in my IQ. One time was 136 and the other was 154. Mm-hmm. So somewhere in the middle. But yeah, I think I was too, and I don't know if IQ or like how much all that means, but it, it means there's some, it measures some kind of intelligence, I guess. But, um, it uh, it was hard because my family just had never questioned certain things. Mm-hmm. You know, they just believed. I mean, my father is still alive to where, like, I can talk to him about all this. And, you know, like, I'm confident I'm not just retro engineering, like, what I think they thought. Like, mm-hmm. um, but, you know, they just hadn't questioned some of the things before because they took it on. You know, they've never been, I always felt like, uh, how did I get born into this family? They were smart, like, don't they're not stupid people. Mm-hmm. No, they're pretty, like, they're, you know, blue blood type, but they just were not, mm-hmm. uh, my grandfather was, he died when I was two. He, I guess I got it from him, supposedly. He was, like, real intellectual and the type that would have had all those answers for mm-hmm. me. Um, but uh, the others, you know, they just, they couldn't explain it to me adequately. Um, and I think they got frustrated and would give up. A lot of times. I just, um, uh, I just, I just thought of something upon the subject of intelligence quotient, the I, the IQ, and I, here's a theory I just thought of: is that uh, if someone has a immeasurably high IQ, uh, it they may have the ability to understand complex ideas, but they may not have the ability to understand the most simple things. defiant as a child and I, I wasn't bad I did not misbehave didn't get in trouble but I just I didn't I didn't want to do bad things if I had I would have nobody could like I just did not like to be told what to do tell me why yeah if uh, IQ is higher and they they can think of understand the most complex things, let's say in science and yeah. math, and, and yet um, they, they they cannot understand or just accept the simplest, simple things without trying Absolutely. to, uh, you know, tear it apart and critique it and, and, and be skeptic. Uh, it's, and it's pride, a lot of it actually really, and it, part of it is that they're too complex, but for me, like they're, they think in a complex way and, and it's a simple gospel, but for me, I, I can distinctly remember I mean, thinking I was so smart and um, surely the whole ultimate reality of everything couldn't be like this thing that all these dum dums, you know, because you know, I had this, like, this idea that Christians are like the simple, like simple, you know, like, uh, I do hillbillies and whatever, whatever the media I was raised. Like, yeah. they let me watch TV way too much. And yeah. I just thought, well, it's not, that's not complicated enough. And they don't know anything. And how could I? I just was proud. I was proud. Right. From a young age, I was very prideful. And that is the biggest problem with intellectuals yeah. who, uh, don't, who reject the gospel is they're proud. And they will have to be brought down to their knee yeah. completely like I was before they will see it in many cases. Okay. I want to know then, uh, getting to the pride and your, how you were brought down and stuff. But so, and from a young age, you were skeptical and uh, showing, even re- re- trying to refute your f- family's faith at, from a young age. Uh, so, um, uh, well, let me let me not jump ahead here. I want to know a little bit about uh, growing up. Uh, did you have any uh, kind of uh, 
interests, uh, you know, and, and, and as a young girl and, and in high school age, uh, uh, what, what kind of things did you spend your time doing in uh, sports or hobbies or dance or anything like that? anything uh, super productive in that way. Uh, I, was, I love to like learn different things. I was like always just absorb random information, like in different subjects I get on a kick about, but I, I was really into horror movies <laughs> from a young age because my dad, he let me watch, like he, he was just being lazy, like he was a lazy guy and he, he would go horror movies and that was some way he could feel like he spent time with me was by letting me watch things he should never have let me watch from a really young age, like The Exorcist and like Night of the Living Dead and, and Dawn of the Dead and Day of the All the Romeros. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, but I was obsessed with horror movies, so yeah. I was into special effects makeup. That was like a hobby um, uh, of mine. I did, like, I really wanted to be special effects artist for until I was about 18. Yeah. Um, but I, that I could say consistently. But other than that, I just was, uh, uh, I was always like, kind of an autodidact. I just like learn, learn, absorb. Information. Just okay, let me. Uh, I want to. Really I, I want to ask the chat room something here, real quick, because I've got a few comments about the sound. Uh, um, Alex and others. Uh, uh, okay. Is my is my audio clear? But uh, Angel's audio is not as clear, or is, are both of them unclear? Just make a comment about that for me, because they're saying your sound. Muffled. Uh, I'm going to ask you to do something. Probably this is probably the hardest thing anybody's ever going to ask you to do, and that is try to talk a little more slowly. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to hurry so uh, that uh, because uh, because uh, uh, I think that if you talk fast, a lot of times the uh, uh, it's not going to be as clear for them to understand. Okay. I have, I can understand I'm you. Also going to clear up the microphone. My phone will pick up. Make sure there's nothing blocking it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Okay. So, uh, all right, we should be good. We'll, we should be good. Okay. All right, I'll try. I'll do that. I, I have a hard time with that, but I'll. <laughs> all right, yeah. Asking, ask her, asking Angel to talk more slowly is like asking someone to part the Red Sea. Yeah. Well, yeah, I get nervous, but I try to, like, I can write real well, but I'm not. Okay. I'm terrible so, uh, let, let's get back to, back to your, uh, your, uh, youthful time actually you're still youthful but uh uh you know from uh, let's say from age seven to 18 in there and you're interested in horror movies and uh and then um did anything uh uh anything really significant uh, happen be, be, uh, let's say uh, up through your high school period that is uh, that you'd like everybody to know about well um yeah uh, i i had been like super like anti-drug my whole existence that I can remember. Uh, and then when I was around 17, this was at a time when I uh, I hadn't heard from my mom. Like, okay, she moved to Texas when I was around 13. And then like after a couple of years, like I had heard that she wasn't taking her medication and that she was, my mom, she, and she, she did have like a, she, she would go in and out of having like a cocaine addiction. Like it would, there'd be years off, years on. And uh, uh, I heard she was doing badly. You know, I always have to hear that from other people. She wouldn't tell me. Um, and I also heard she was on her medication. And so then it would go like months out hearing from her. Uh, and then I got to where I was too scared to hear from her because I was scared I was going to, I was convinced that I was here that she was in a hospital dying. That's like what that whole thing, like I, that, thinking that, cause you know, the whole terminality of AIDS and HIV changed, mm -hmm. like while I was a kid, like it used to be like a death sentence. And then in the middle of me growing up and having a mom with HIV, uh, it changed, but I didn't really know that. So like to where people were living with it mm -hmm. and not like necessarily dying, you know, within like a few years. So every year that went by, I thought, well, surely my mom's gonna die because like people don't survive this, they die really quick. And uh, so I actually like wouldn't talk to anybody, including her from Texas for like two years. I was really mad at her too, obviously, because of the not being on her medication. And um, I convinced myself she was dead, literally for two years straight. I convinced myself that my mom was dead um, because uh, I guess I was just, part of me was just like, I wanted, I was tired of worrying and I just decided that she was because I hadn't heard from her and then like, uh, you know, she had been in the hospital and it was, I just totally mm -hmm. froze, got scared, didn't want to face re any of it and um, 
I didn't talk to my mom for two years, and I was I got real messed up. Uh, I was very anti-drug. I like didn't do drugs or anything. Um, but then one night I had like a horrible panic attack, really bad panic attack. I mean, I thought I was gonna die. Um, and like I had also been having these panic attacks, and I started to like self mutilate. Like I would just kind of like cut my arms, not because anybody told me to. And it was I don't even. I think it was like this big demonic thing. I mean, I'm sure I was under a lot of demonic influence now looking back, but it was, uh, it was like, and um, I uh, remember that I felt like if I just could get through this panic attack that I knew was just a temporary thing, maybe like that I wouldn't kill myself mm. or I wouldn't like, you know, cut my, like it would just go away. And so I, um, I knew my dad had Valium. I knew that was for anxiety. So I went looking for that because I was desperate. I mean, I'd never done anything, not weed. I had I didn't like to drink. I still don't drink. But I couldn't find that. All I could find was my grandmother's pain pills to lower set. And uh, I knew that was kind of like, I said, I remember thinking, it was like baby heroin, right? Like, and that makes you go sleepy, sleepy right? So I took it. And it like, I should never forget it. <laughs> my dad had been, I mean, I, I didn't go into this. I had been a heroin addict for um, like 20 years. And then he got on methadone. He wasn't, my dad's like a very strange drug addict because he's not like, a wild child or anything. He uh, he was always there and just, you know, very, he, he was just self-medicating, essentially. He was not like some unstable loose cannon, strangely, somehow. It's, it's weird. He never, he never got in trouble. Very strange. That's unusual. Um, but uh, he's, you know, he's a great man. He's better now. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I shouldn't have messed with it. I should have known I was going to be prone to being addicted, but I couldn't imagine that because I was so against drugs. I just thought this was like a pragmatic thing. And I got totally like addicted right then <laughs> because it took away like all the things I didn't want to feel that I have been dealing with by myself for so long. Um, it made me, I remember feeling like, I'm like I, nobody can touch me. Oh my gosh, I don't care what anyone thinks. I, I felt so good. I felt fine. It was just the best. And then I did that. I took one for like two weeks. And then they got, my grandmother got really low. And I was like, oh crap, I can't take anymore. She's going to notice. And um, uh, I got sick. Like really, really sick. And instead of, I mean, I was empty, obviously. I didn't, I rejected the gospel, the true gospel. I was so lucky to even have family that believed it. And I went up by seven. I was already like messed up enough. And I, I wasn't because I was like abused. I, I don't remember like any type of, like I didn't know, physically, sexually, otherwise. I was very, very blessed as a child. And I, um, later on, I learned just how blessed and lucky I was um, to not have any, been harmed in any way like that growing up down there. But um, yeah, I was, but I was just emotionally screwed up, you know, losing, like having my mom out of the house, you know, like when I was three and her going off the deep, everything I went through just gave me like kind of like borderline personality disorder tendencies for a while, especially yeah. in my teens and 20s. I, uh, instead of thinking, wow, this made me sick when I t stopped taking it and like really sick, I should never take it again. I was like, well, I just need to never run out of it again. And um, I, I was pretty much, I was addicted to painkillers um, uh, like Lorset uh, for uh, like three years after that. Um, I just, I didn't like do anything crazy for them. I didn't, uh, you know, I never even bought drugs. You know, uh, I just would seek them from my family. Um, there was always too much pain medicine around at my family's house. Uh, my aunt was a nurse and um, anyway, I started like taking my dad's methadone because he would have like a take home supply and I would sneak a tiny little bit out. I thought this was pragmatic again because I just didn't want to tell anybody. I didn't want to deal with it. I just didn't, I just wanted to just keep doing it, go to college, just, I just wanted to maintain. And you just get really sick when you run out of opiates if you're, on, if you're addicted to them. Uh, and it's, it's, it's not quite like other drugs that I have since done um, because, you know, it's not about, it becomes like you're not, you're just not just trying to get high anymore. You don't, it's not even about that. It's just, mm -hmm. you're going to get really miserably ill for like a long time <laughs> if you stop taking them. And if you like don't have the guts to go through that, you know, um, 
you know, it just seems like a pragmatic thing to keep taking them. But I just, uh, yeah, I subsisted that way with the methadone for a few years. Um, so actually, no, it was about seven, eight years, probably seven, eight years total. And, and what, to, what was the time, time? What was the age period of that was going on? Okay, from 18 to um, 26, 25, 26. I was on, uh, on and off, but mainly on. Like I was, I was not the type of person that were like, like I had to know that I would have like regular access to these drugs um, to keep taking them. Like I, I quit a couple times when I like had to go visit my mom in Texas, and there was just no way for me to get them. I wasn't like that person that would take them like just whenever they could and know they'd be sick most of the time because they couldn't get it. You know, it was not that was not practical to me, but. You know, when I got back to my family's house and it was around eventually, uh, I would take it again. And um, you know, I wasn't I wasn't like a partier. This is all just like very solitary in my room. You know, yeah. like try, just very weird drug addict to myself. But uh, that was a big turning point when I when I got off of it because I eventually, you know, I went to a rehab in my late twenties. But we'll stop there if you want to. Yeah, back. yeah. I was that was my next question. Is that so? so uh, let me kind of summarize, see if I followed it all correctly here. Okay, so you're having uh, things were bothering you enough that you would harm yourself by cutting yourself. And then you found out that these medications could help you. And then the, by, by taking the medications, you got addicted. But you were not taking the the opiates uh, to get high. You're, you can you basically were taking them because they were necessary. Eventually, eventually, yeah. No, at first, I mean, like that. I mean, I was I was sitting high uh, when when I first you know the first time I took it. I mean, that was yeah. what it was with the, uh, the euphoric rush. I didn't really recognize it as that because they didn't make me like create like loopy and like weird like on. Mm -hmm. Like the people I'd seen smoking weed or doing like or drinking, so I didn't really count. I didn't think <clears throat> because I felt like I was mainly myself, but secretly inside I felt super, super good. That okay. was what I thought. I mean, I wasn't. My All eyes right. were like rolling so my, my, head, but yeah. my my question is then then. Um, uh, with all that history, uh, have mm. even to till today, uh, at any point in time, have you ever gotten to the bottom of what was causing the bad feelings that you were going through? What, what, yeah, was, what well, was the cause? Because you grew up in a family that loved you and treated you very well. There wasn't abuse, and there wasn't. Mom. So it was. It, it was, was what was. It was with my mom. Yeah, I, my, my mom. I really loved my mom. She was amazing. Like she was such a sweet. Like anybody to know her was to love her. But she had a side to her that was just. She was abused. Her father molested her, and um, she was abused. She was real messed up from that. Um, just kind of hated herself. Very self destructive. And um, she never like she never leaves well enough alone. She left my dad because because he was too good. Like he was just really good to her. He didn't like hit her or anything like that. You know, he was just and he was good to her till the day she died. Mm -hmm. And he never stopped loving her. But yeah, she I, I when I was three is when they got divorced. And um, they, then she was trying in it back and forth. You know, mm -hmm. a couple of years after that. Um, but uh, uh, you know, cut, cut going back to him and you know leave in, but. Basically, I was like, I had abandonment issues because my mommy, who, you know, I wish she wasn't so wonderful and like loving and warm because it wouldn't have hurt so much, you know, but she was, you know, wonderful and I missed her. And uh, even though I got to spend so much time with her, you know, because eventually she stabilized for a good long time and I would spend all every weekend with her and every mm -hmm. summer when she moved when I was 13 to Texas. It re just it reopened all those wounds. So what age yeah, what age were life. you when your mother died? I was uh, twenty eight. Twenty eight. Twenty eight. Okay. So you go through all this and about right age of twenty six or something. Finally, you got past the drug period, and a couple yeah. of years after that, your mother has died. And uh, I'm I'm assuming at some point coming up pretty soon. Uh, you started yeah. uh, seeking God somehow, um, and I don't want to put words in your mouth. How did uh, how did Jack die? Jack killed himself. He killed himself on the third anniversary of his mother, my aunt's death. 
who she died from cancer. Uh -huh. How old was he? Um, at, how, how old was he, he was when he? Twenty two. Wow. Twenty two. And how, 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 how close were you? Out. How close were you to Jack? Like like brother and sister, we grew up together. I mean, he yeah. was. I have a little brother, but he, my mom, you know, moved to Texas when he was three and I was thirteen. So, uh, but with Jack, um, we were raised together basically. He was five years younger than me, um, and he was everything to me. Like when I would think about killing myself when I got real, real down, you know, uh, in my addiction and everything, uh, uh, I would not do it because of him. Like he was the reason because I loved him so much and he was precious and sweet. And um, so he, he was gay, though. Um, he said, uh, you know, we found we found out that at, found that out, you know, when he was in his early to mid teens. Um, and uh, he's never comfortable with himself. Like we never saw him have a relationship uh, or anything. Like he was, it was strange. He, he had, uh, I don't know. I, I suspect some things happened to him when he was in Catholic school. And yeah, he killed himself three months after my first child was born. So I lost my mom, um, and I found that I was pregnant with my first child with my then fiance uh, Mark um, uh, on at her the night of her memorial service. And um, then uh, I had the baby, and the only other mother figure I had, so I had lost my aunt, who was one of my mother figures, my mother, and then my grandmother, who, who raised me with my dad, died, uh, she died a month after my little cousin. So my little cousin Jack killed himself three months after I had my first baby, and then my grandmother died about a month later, mm -hmm. and it was sudden in every case. And mm -hmm. um, uh, that was that was a turning point. It, you know, <laughs> that was where uh, everything. Because and also my my fiance Mark, um, he uh, he met him. He was a speaker at the rehab. He was clean, and whatever, and it was really a terrible idea. Never do that. Never do that. Never date anybody that you meet in rehab, even if they're the speaker and they're not a, a, you know a patient or anymore. Even if they're like an AA meeting leader, don't just don't. It's a bad idea. But uh, he was, um, he relapsed um, and actually stole like a couple grand from my uncle who had just lost his entire family. And he was estranged from his own family. So my uncle had been married to my aunt for almost 40 years and they only had one child. And he was like, a, he was very, I was very close to my uncle Terry. Um, he was like, uh, like a closer than my blood uncles. Um, and uh, Mark was supposed to be remodeling the bedroom that my little cousin killed himself in because my uncle couldn't enter it because of the bullet wound, the bullet, you know, damage to the wall. And Mark instead stole checks, you know, barely did any work, stole a bunch of checks, and uh, eventually found out that he stole like two grand to, and he was spending them on drugs. And uh, that was like the one thing he could have done, you know, that made me just, you know, I, 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 he had to go. Like he had to, I, I didn't know what to do, but he couldn't. I, I couldn't be with him anymore. Yeah. You know, I mean, I wasn't saved. A lot of things would be different now, <laughs> but at the time, you know, I just realized. You know, I love Mark. Mark is, I, I'm not even. He's a wonderful, good-hearted person. He has a lot of problems, um, but I you know I'm not trying to speak ill of him. He's actually like I've forgiven him completely because because I've been saved. It just lifted all the anger from my heart. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, that was like the worst year of my life, and I didn't want to live anymore. So. Um, even though I had a newborn, I didn't, I wasn't going to kill myself because I knew how awful that was now. Um, but uh, I, I just remember legitimately, truly not wanting to live anymore. Like not in the way where people are just bitter and they want to hurt others so they kill themselves to, or they say they're going to because they want to teach someone a lesson. Like I didn't want to play anymore I mean, because life clearly there was some, you know, I, I thought that all this was against the rules. What are the odds? It's like lightning striking five times, you know. And um, I realized uh, that, was, that was how I realized that there was more out there than just probability, you know. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was the, that's when I realized there was a force out there. And at the time, that was when I went from agnostic atheist to I just started openly cursing God with my mouth. I knew there had to be one uh, or something like that because it was punishing me, I felt. And um, I was just angry, you know. But I think God considered that progress. Because at least I noticed, yeah. <laughs> I kind of, you know, that there was something more than my stupid materialistic, you know, 
scientism. That was kind of basically what my faith was, my religion, mm-hmm. you know, scientism. And, um, yeah, that, that's how he had to get through me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, that's, that's fascinating. Uh, uh, the uh, obviously we no one wants someone to die so that so that uh, um, they that will somehow bring them to to Jesus. But it is un, it is not uncommon that that is the result. When it happened with me when my mother died. That's what yep. that was the impetus that that led me to Jesus. I need I needed answers to what happens after we die and is there a purpose to life and and so yeah. I imagine that uh, all this death it made you uh, realize that, that hey there's you needed answers to make it all make sense. Well, it was it was death plus having children, and but it was there was also something you know like I I'm, I don't know how long it would have stayed in that state of just idea that there was a god but i was just pissed and but then i had just this miraculous um something changed uh within like so let's call it about my daughter was about nine months old and um i had made uh, her father leave um he was the one working i was staying home with her so i had nowhere to go i mean he had to go he didn't have a job at that point uh he had just destroyed his whole life and uh you know he had to go to rehab and jail for what he did to my uncle so i was kind of it wasn't really a choice so much i mean he's gone anyway but um uh just so happened that my uh a guy that i had carried a torch for that i had been in love with ever since i was 19 it was like the one guy that like you know turned me down uh and said you know basically because i was not mature enough and i was too self-destruct too self-destructive you know and he like that was basically why, you know, it was the one person, like, he had this integrity. I didn't even know the word for what it was about him. Uh, I had to look it up once. I remember it was integrity, which is rare in Florida. And um, and that's what he, he was from Indiana. And uh, he uh, he was visiting Florida to, uh, to check out his mom's condo. And he and I had stayed close, uh, or not close, we had been in contact, you know, um, uh, and I never stopped loving him. He was like the only person like that I ever felt like that about, like where I never gave up, never stopped, never got over it. And um, he, he stopped by, he actually asked me, like he's like, hey, you know, he wanted to come just stop by and see how I was doing because he heard about my little cousin, you know, and he had known him and known how much I loved him. And he was just in the area and he stopped to, you know, just to see me. I didn't want to see him, you know. Uh, I did just because I knew he was so not the type to go out on a limb like that and uh, ask to, like, if you think, because he knew I had, you know, as far as he knew, I was, you know, engaged and all that. So it wasn't, I just, I, but I didn't want to see him, you know, for the first time in my life, like, I wasn't trying or angry. Like, I didn't want to have a relationship ever again, anything ever again. Um, I barely wanted to leave my child, who I saw as literally just, she was just a threat of more pain. I was like, so what's next? She's going to die or I'm going to die. Well, you know, either way, we're going to get our hearts broken. Like one of us, both of us. And uh, it was unbearable. But um, when Joel came and just visited me that night, you know, um, and he found out the situation and everything. Somehow that's when he fell in love with me. I don't understand it. Uh, I was like, but loose and fancy free at 19. And he didn't want anything to do with it. He was a few years older than me, but saddled with a child and like a drug adult, you know, fiance and, you know, all the bills in my name. And that's when he decides to fall in love with me. But um, he, um, he was the only person I would have trusted ever around my child in that moment. Um, it was crazy. Uh, uh, so I didn't, he offered just to help us. He didn't, you know, he was said like I could move in to, you know, help you guys with bills. And he saw the situation we were in, my family couldn't help. Because uh, pretty much all the time my dad and my aunt left, and all the money that they used to have, just they, they lost, my family lost everything around when I was about 13. And that's another story for another day. But, um, you know, we had like a $4 million estate. Uh, you know, it was pretty privileged, and they just lost everything. So, um, yeah, they couldn't, you know, I was, I was really in a bad situation, but it wasn't about money. Like, that's not why um, <laughs> I was, I mean, if you only knew how crazy it was about Joel my whole life. But for, for that to happen, you know, especially when I wasn't looking for it or wanting it, the last, last thing I was interested in was romance. Um, that was the first hint 
I had that this force that I was angry at, you know, this God, because, you know, Joel, and we ended up moving to Indiana where he's from. And it was just, and ever since then, you know, we've had just this amazing relationship. My daughter was the, at nine months. She would like scream and cry if the stranger looked at her, especially if they were, came in our house. She was very scared of strangers. And he came in and picked her up and she smiled. And that was the first time it had ever happened. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and so I knew it was meant to be. And so basically that, that began like this whole point where my life turned around and just unbelievable grace and favor and just incredible blessings started happening in my life that uh, I, you know, it take a long time to list them all, but suddenly I realized that this force that I noticed um, wanted the best for me is all I can put it. Hmm. Um, and, and, and actually uh, that, and so it was about a two year process after that before I actually got saved and realized it was, you know, the Lord, you know, God of the Bible. So that's the first time, uh, that's moving to Indiana, that was the first time you've moved away from Florida then? Uh, yeah, basically, yeah. So, and uh, are you, uh, if you don't mind, are you, are you living there now in Indiana or do you have you? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so you, have you lived in Indiana since that time, since you left Florida? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Yep. And I love it. Okay. So now we're all, I'm sure everybody's very curious about Joel. Is he still in your life? How's that worked out? Yes. But um, it was, um, we've always had just an incredibly, like, peaceful relationship. Like, we, you know, we want the same things. Um, that's part of it. Like, he is not, so when we got together, we, neither one of us was saved. But um, he was raised a believer. And he actually did believe, well, believe when he was a kid, whatever that means. I'm still not sure. But, you know, he was, and the true gospel, his family actually believed the true gospel. Um, and, um, but his mother went to Buddhism when her dad died and he was raised by his mom and, uh, he analyzed her, uh, and she's a pretty, you know, pretty impressive woman. So I get it. But, uh, he went kind of like when, you know, where if you would have asked him what he was for the past 20 years, he would have said Buddhist, right? Mm. Well, um, just recently we had a conversation where, you know, I mean, he started realizing a lot of the same things I've been, re- you know, I was realizing over this whole process of, awakening to a lot of lies in the world um you know they call it waking up or whatever like i he he told me sandy hook was a hoax essentially within a few months of coming here and i had never heard of that i mean i didn't even know that was an option to believe that like i didn't i was like what but then he showed me a lot of like the documentary and a lot of evidence and and that just like changed a lot like that was a big turning point in terms of like what would have led me to realize like the bible was true um, uh, you know, it was, uh, God put me in a place where, so I had suffered all this. I had nothing like I, like ego death, no pride left. Like my life was absolute crap. Uh, and I didn't want to live, <laughs> you know, um, but he picked me up and he put me in a place where, um, I was away from everything, like away from like a lot of the bad stuff in my past. And, you know, my family, as much as I love them, you know, some of their just codes function. They questioned me away in Indiana, uh, where I don't know anybody except Joel. And um, this is when I was actually finally start able, in a position where I was, because I stayed home with, you know, the children, able to turn my uh, analytical abilities toward what would eventually lead me to, to, to realizing the Bible was true. Um, but it started with, like, realizing this lie and that lie, you know, conspiracy theories, so-called uh, because I always hated conspiracy theorists, like a lot. Like I wrote essays about what was wrong with conspiracy theorists and how they had schizotypal disorder and all this stuff. So I was, you know, it took a lot. But uh, you know, that was. I really feel like he he set me away from any kind of like stress or anything because it takes. You know, a lot of people don't realize these things because they haven't had the time, you mm-hmm. know, or the um, the peace of mind. To just look into this kind of stuff, where that's what they do. You know, I spend a lot of time looking into it, unraveling lies, and um, you know that has been a process. Uh, but Joel, uh, recently, you know, we had a conversation, and um, he tried to make he didn't believe <laughs> the God, you know, the Bible or the gospel. Like he tried to, he, he 
she, uh, like, because we had definitely had conversations before since I got saved, where he was like, you know, we're Christian, right? You know, and stuff, and, you know, disagreeing about it. And then recently we talked, and I'd seen him changing, you know, but I, I just tried not to push because I knew, knowing him, it would have to feel like his idea if it was, you know, things have to be like his idea or he won't ever, he won't ever deal with, you know, accept it. But um, recently uh, he talked to me, you know, he, he was asking me all these questions, you know, that's when you can tell somebody might actually be open and, or maybe even starting to believe because suddenly they ask you questions like, like, you know, the answers. And I'm talking about like people you're close to, you know, like your family, you know what I mean? Like, uh, instead of, you know, not wanting to hear it from you or just putting up with you talking about Jesus, they're wanting to know things, you know, and that's how it started. And he was asking all these questions about what the, like the details of the gospel and, and trying to make it seem like he, he wasn't asking for himself. He was asking for somebody else. Uh. <laughs> but then we talked for a few, we talked for a few hours and he, you know, he, uh, I think he's really close, if not already there. It was it was really great. Um, yeah. But that's just very recent development. So until until then, I had been saved, and he had been not. You know, he not was not yeah. a believer. So well, I'm going to ask. Let me ask everybody in the congregation now to uh, let, let's all pray for Joel to see the light and uh, come to the realization that uh, etern eternal life is, is his through Jesus Christ and. Uh, so everybody keep, keep Joel in your, you. in your prayers for that. Uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, matter of fact, an uh, interesting thing is that, uh, you know, there, within our own uh, trying to analyze uh, uh, not, not just not what we have to believe, but, but uh, how, how well we, we must believe and, and also uh, um, can we choose to believe or does it uh, and uh, all this stuff thought is being put into this in this discussion within the, all of our friends but uh, I came up a couple of days ago with the, the it's not it's not original by any means because there's a song that says I saw the light and I love that song but to me I think that's that's really what happens uh, when a person believes it's not that they could somehow make a decision. Well, I want to be a Christian. I'm going to believe this. No, they see the light. They they they, they realize it's true, and it's a, it's a realization. And, and yeah. uh, uh, so. Uh, and then the Holy Spirit really, in my experience at least, does like fills in a lot of the gaps after that. Like what, you know, once you really come and you you you, you really you see the light enough to even you know I, you know. Because I mean, I'm not saying you have to. You don't have to pray or ask God for anything. But I, mm -hmm. I naturally started talking to him uh, yeah. and uh, say, you know, like first thing I asked was, "Can you just please show me how wherever I think I disagree with the Bible, I'm wrong and you're right?" Mm -hmm. You know, that was like a big thing for me. And um, it, it, a lot of times it was like a download yeah. that I would later go and make sure, like, okay, I would read the Bible, make sure that that was like accurate. But a lot of times I would just be doing something and I would start thinking. Like over things, and I swear it was like, holy spirit, just yeah, uh, give me understanding right I, there. You know, I like that. Uh, I like that use of that word download. I heard that first from uh, Brother Ronnie. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I hope he's still with us, but he, he may be with the Lord now. I haven't talked to him for a few months, but um, he, he's known as Hood Minister or Saint Hood because he he, he has a life of uh, being in the the gang gang life and stuff but but he's he's also come up with a couple of sayings i like and he, the idea of a download that that god downloads in other words i call it an epiphany uh, a revelation from god or god downloads where you're reading things you read it 20 years but you, uh, but all of a sudden this time boom it, you get it and and you wonder why didn't I see that all these years? And it's, it's so obvious now. And it, is it a download that, that God just revealed it to you? <laughs> well, you know, um, I will say, and I, this is uh, this is a topic for another day too, because this is like this is like a part of my story. I told you a little bit. Really extensive, like real crazy, like just. I, but it, it, it's hard for me to leave it out or not even touch on it because I, it feels dishonest. But like a, a, the, the, from point A to point B, like from where I started believing in spirits and theories and looking into them, and then being saved, like, what came in the middle of it was dealing firsthand in person with um, Luciferian, although I, I didn't get in, you know, I wasn't abused, but my best friend since preschool, you know, and her family turned out to be Luciferian, uh, my little, like, 
parents don't just all, you know, including her parents, but they also subject her to it. Um, and, you know, it's not speculation, like all confirmed crazy things happened. You know, the, they tried to kidnap my child. It's a very long story, but I, if I touch on it too briefly, I'll just sound nuts. But if I go, it'll take you know, like a long time to explain. Um, but um, what I want to say, though, is is that in the process of dealing with that and having her in my home, because I thought I thought I was helping her, like I thought she was trying to get away from them. Um, I saw a demon, literally a demon. I'd never seen anything supernatural before. I seen there was a demon that was apparently attached to her. Um, uh, you know, actually, before I ever you know believed in any of this stuff or knew about her programming. You know, this thing, uh, I, I guess, like, that was actually the first time I saw something supernatural. Like, I, like a year prior to that whole experience, um, you know, we had experienced what appeared to be, a, like, an apparition, you know, while she and I were together. Uh, so, it has been attached to her, I guess, forever, probably. But um, uh, she, it, when she was, what I thought, trying to break her mind control programming and just get away from her family and, you know, take shelter in my home far away from Florida, this thing manifested and caused trouble in our house. Not real scary. I will say that. It was not, it was, that's how I knew it was not my imagination because I was terrified of demons. Uh, it was not very frightening. It was just annoying and troublesome and it looked like a black smoke uh, figure thing. Uh, how, did, you see, did you see it more than once? Yes, yes. Um, I saw it probably like three times, um, but it also did other things. Phenomenon in the house. Like it would, I caused Joel sleep paralysis, which he didn't even know about it at this point because um, I didn't want to, my best room was crazy. But the night where like the activity peaked, um, uh, it, we were out in the garage, she and I, and she felt like she was being possessed. Uh, she, it was really a strange situation. And I was not a believer at this point. But uh, he, he uh, well, during that time, he actually had sleep paralysis for the first time in his life, which I had had as a child a lot. And um, he, I had talked to him prior to this, you know, and asked if he'd ever had it. Well, Joel is like, doesn't believe anything. Or he thinks I'd be lying. <laughs> All right. Uh, but he, this, this, you know, it happened to him. There was not a coincidence. And, uh, you know, I told him about what had been going on that morning. And, it, you know, so he was a witness to it um, after that. And, yeah, we saw it. I saw it more than once. Uh, it also like touched me, and it ca- I, I, it, it, I really believe it was it even uh, caused very strange dreams while she was in the house because they were just not my dreams. If you know what I mean, mm-hmm. you know they were like very strange, just emotional. It was like it was a parasite kind of. It seemed to be feeding off of emotions, not just fear or anger. Like it didn't really care what kind. It just any kind of emotional spike it could generate was good enough. It was not. I'm gonna guess it was not a very high level demon in the in the hierarchy. It was seemed like like sort of like a. Um, her mother said that later on that it was a, uh, what did she call it, a bloodline uh, generational hellhound that was uh, attached that was sent, sent around to protect what she called the family jewels. Um, so uh, yeah, that's I all sounds really nuts. But the point is, uh, this thing was going on in my house for you know a while. Like the first time she visited, and then. The second time she came and visited, after I re- knew, figured out what the deal was with her family and all this, everything, because um, that's when I had found out about um, SRA and MK Ultra and Luciferianism, and I realized, well, that, wait, okay, that's my my best friend and her family that I had been very close to. Uh, like all the, like, it was everything, and they were very, they were, they thought it was adorable when I finally figured it out. <laughs> it was so weird, uh, but anyway, I saw this thing flee the name of Jesus. Now, I did not believe at the time, and I had, we had tried a lot of different things as unbelievers, tried pretty much everything but the biblical way of getting rid of one of these things. I I had told myself it was not a demon, but a a dark interdimensional, you know, it's it's like, it's 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 like a life form, you know, we just don't understand it, we've always called them demons, and, um, you know, (laughs) I, I, we tried like psychological techniques, uh, you know, ended up being a psych major, so, you know, a little bit about that kind of stuff, uh, just uh, even Native American stuff, like pretty much pagan, uh, uh, you know, or occultic ways of getting rid of it, um, uh, it positive affirmations, whatever. Uh, nothing worked. <laughs> nothing did anything to this thing. Uh, it, but the minute that uh, it appeared to my daughter, my three year old, uh, my friend and I, because she saw it and she said, Doggy! And it terrified us so 
realized that we both instinctively said the Lord's Prayer at that moment. It was very strange. It was like a reflex. And that thing didn't ever come back. Like, no, no disturbances from that thing uh, after that. Like, not at least so that I was aware of or anybody else. You know, I'm sure it still bothers her. Um, but uh, that was a big deal. Like, I didn't want it to work. You understand? Like, I, I didn't want to be wrong. <laughs> about everything ever basically you know that that would that made me wrong with everything when i saw that because i've seen the other things not work you know if yeah. it hadn't been for seeing other things fail it wouldn't have been so powerful yeah but um yeah no nobody could explain it any other way like oh no it's just well dark or lightness light always defeats mm -hmm. dark or no i tried all the other kind of light worker techniques no the only thing that just you know made this thing like run away and never come back was calling on the name of the lord you know, mm -hmm. uh, which I assume is essentially like the same as using the name of Jesus. I mean, we said the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so that it was a big thing for me. I have actually never, I don't know what it would be like to go from that moment of not believing to believing without, it's almost not fair because I feel like I, I saw it proved, mm -hmm. you know. But it might, I, I think I was just that sick, you know. That's how much God... He, he really moved mountains to get through me. And I believe it's because I had true believers, like in my mother and my father and my grandmother, praying for me my whole life. And they didn't bash me over the head with the Bible. They didn't try to fight me once they realized that I, I was a stubborn, <laughs> special case, you know, from a young age. Uh, they prayed. And I believe, especially with my grandmother, I mean, she had that childlike faith. She couldn't even imagine that I wouldn't be saved, that God wouldn't do whatever he had to do to get through me, you know? And um, I really believe that that is perhaps a big part of why so many dramatic things folded in my life. Mm -hmm. But I also would like to tell people that I think the way God looks at it is, you know, um, he can lead everybody to water, but not everybody will drink. It's just, you know, not everybody may, may have, like, these dramatic, crazy things happen to them, like, lose their whole family in a year or see a demon to get them saved, because they don't, that would, that's not what it would take to get them to the point where they are going to have to choose between real, like, accepting the truth or act, like, becoming, like, a w willfully lying to themselves. Because up until then, I was not consciously lying to myself. I really didn't believe, you know, I really didn't understand. I had tried like, especially when I was getting clean, and I saw that Christians really had, sort of, they had something I wanted, but I didn't really know what, but I, I just couldn't figure out how to understand the gospel, or the whole story, you know, it just, I didn't get it, you know, I, there was just that spiritual component missing, and, um, but I was not lying to myself, and I think God knew that if he put me in a position where I had no choice but to choose between, like, consciously lying to myself, and, you know, like, becoming, like, complicit in it, um, or, uh, you know, accepting the truth, um, mm -hmm. and being honest with myself about what I saw, that I would choose the truth, but not everybody will, because we're told even that, um, people will see, you know, see the return of Jesus and, you know, or see God's wrath and they'll still be cursing and rejecting him. It's crazy, mm -hmm. you know, they still will repent. Yeah. And that, wow. you know, because they, that's in their heart. That is, you know, they... They don't just not believe like they hate God when it comes down to it. You know, there's like a, I guess there's a difference. Um, and um, even though it would have appeared that I really hated God <laughs> most of my life, I think God knew that, uh, that I just didn't understand. And if I did, you know, that I would, that I, that I would believe. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that, that's where I'm at, you know, yeah. it's just amazing. I mean... I just want to tell him, he knows you so personally. He knows you better than you know yourself. And he knows, he knows like, like every, everything you ever felt or experienced is so very personal with God. And I think of so many unbelievers, I wish that they understood that. But it's not so just like, a, you know, austere, remote authority figure who's God of all creation. Like he's, he's your best friend you never knew you had, you know, and he, He's everything. He's your father. Um, he's, he's, he's awesome. Mm -hmm. He's just... Uh, Amen. For pra new every day. Yeah. Praise Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm just love uh, how you came to believe. And basically, um, 
you you had no choice because you would have had to deny what was proven to you and uh, uh that's uh, i've often talked about um uh, the apostle paul i don't believe he had faith because jesus actually appeared to him and showed himself you, you know we the bible says that uh we walk, we walk by faith, not by sight, and faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So if we can see and touch the way that Thomas did and the way that Paul did, it's not faith. It's, it's, it's actually uh, knowledge. It's God's proven it to you. Um, you I don't have to. said that. Uh, That's exactly what I think. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, I think there's a difference. And, and, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. So there's something about, and Jesus, Jesus said that to Thomas, now that you've seen me, you believe me. Of course, anybody would do that, right? But he says, but blessed or happy are those people who don't get to see me, and yet they will still believe in me. That's, he values us believing, trusting, relying, and putting our faith in him. He, he, he values that over somebody that has it demonstrated and proven to them. But in your case, uh, it was shown to you. There was no, it was like for me, uh, uh, for me to, uh, to, to argue in favor of Darwinism after I see, after I see that uh, the proof that it's uh, absolutely absurd. I mean, to me, the, 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 the genetic code proves to me that there's a mind. If there's a mind that's designed us, that's the genetic code that proves it. And, and the irreducible complexity or uh, the fact that uh, we had to be created intact as a finished product, it's impossible that we could have evolved a little bit at a time. Um, oh, I know. And I love evolution. I under, I, well, it, as much as you can understand a lie, I really understood it. Like, I was, I was you know, a biology major recently, mm -hmm. and I really loved it. And I, I still can't believe, like, I asked all those questions, though. And, I, you know, I told myself at every point, somebody answered that question, but I just don't know Yeah. Um, you know, all of those questions. Now, though, how, did, how did sexual reproduction happen perfectly the first time? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. It's, it's so nonsensical, and yet we were brainwashed and we just never questioned authority. But if a person yeah. stops to use their own brain for a minute and start being analytical, you see the, the holes in the theories. And and more recently, this these things were. were uh, that, these were revelations I got many, many years ago, but but more recently now I've, I've it's brought to my attention that the world as I've understood it and been taught is totally different than I believed. And now I can, it's inescapable. I have to conclude that if I can see things that are too far away that should be behind the curve of the earth, if we can see those things and there's hundreds of examples, I, I would have to be uh, uh, foolish to deny it. Messiah pointed out to me that 
that, you know, where the faith came in was I still had to believe the right gospel because there's there's a lot, you know, out there. Uh, once you realize the Bible's true, that's not you know you're not you're not at home base necessarily. Yeah. Um, and um, I uh, the, the faith, you know, the childlike faith that came from trusting. You know that God would never leave or forsake me, yeah. and that you know Christ was sufficient. Uh, so I I think that that's that extra step. But but mm-hmm. if it weren't for that, I mean I think you're right. Like it's really not it's mm-hmm. not faith. It's like, yeah, I'm not you know if you have it proven to you, it doesn't it doesn't really count because there's no faith, and that's all God has ever wanted is for us to trust Him. Yes, you know which is what we did not do from the very beginning. Yeah. You know we thought we knew better, or, or that it's like a child. You know, being a parent really helps helps uh, un- unlock the gospel. Uh, I, I think a lot having to deal with children, and um, there's, there's so many. That's why we have children. I, I'm convinced that's why God right. wanted us to have children is so that we would learn to, to understand His feelings for us. You know, and the the nature of you know what what it is to be a child of God, like when you're yeah. born again, and what that means, and um. I don't think enough people, you know, realize. Uh, you know, maybe some people can really understand love be, without having a child. But I think for most people, until you have a child, you can't really comprehend what love is. And it warps you. Like my aunt, I love my aunt so much, my, my surviving aunt. She's um, 60 now. Uh, she never had children. It's not that she didn't want them, but her husband like, left her. Uh, she and she just aged out basically. Uh, she has cats, but and she's wonderful. And she is a safe believer, and man, she has got she's very, very uh, smart. Uh, she, she, you know, you, you guys would love her. She, you know, has a lot of great insights, but um, you know, it, she, you know, that whole gauntlet of pain and suffering that we went through with losing everybody, you know, it, it was for them too. My, 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 my dad and my aunt, they were they're the um, sole survivors. And um, they were much, they grew up a lot too. But um, it, my aunt, you know, she's, it kind of just makes, I, like, people that don't have kids, like, I always want like, man, you don't, you don't understand, like, when you're, like, 50 or 60, and especially if you didn't have kids because you chose not to, like, you're going to be a little creepy or just a little bit, uh, like, a little narcissistic and you don't realize it, like, you don't realize how selfish and self-centered you sometimes as, as wonderful as she is, and, and she, does so much for so many people and she's not selfish but that never having children thing like she she's unintentionally self-centered a lot of the time in, in the way she sees things or or just uh, the things that come out of her mouth and she doesn't realize it but it, but i i never completely realized it until i had kids you know um and it changed me completely too but i'm going to say you know for people that don't have kids you must really be awesome that's all i know you must be just so awesome that like a life that's lived entirely for yourself is just totally complete because i was not that awesome uh, i was kind of an a-hole and uh, uh having my children was great because suddenly uh, i didn't have to focus on myself constantly anymore yeah. so that's just really a never-ending you know cycle of pointlessness uh in my experience and uh, it was just a futile existence uh and having children it answers a lot of questions for you like yeah. what should they do what should i do with myself what should, what's the right thing for me to do now i mean you know what you have to do whatever but yeah. and also like that you're no longer like wondering like uh you know what you know what the purpose of your life is i mean you know you might have some questions i mean depending on your situation but having children really like fills in a lot of that <laughs> um because uh you know, especially if you're particularly aimless um, and unambitious, <laughs> it, yeah. it helps. I, I recommend that um, even for people that maybe seem like your life's a bit out of control, you know, uh, I believe that that's uh, a lot of times a result of not having children, um, mm-hmm. you know, by a certain age. Uh, so, uh, you know, God definitely meant for us to have kids for a reason. We haven't, you know, we don't complete our... Mm-hmm. Are like our growth cycle or something until we do, um, and so even if you're never saved or anything, uh, there is just a part of you that won't ever mature if you don't have them. I believe now. Now that's not for every single person. Like if you couldn't have children or something like that, that's different, you know, um, because it's the people that just like they could have and they choose not to, you know, that uh, and they stick to that. And that's who I thought I was going to be. I never wanted kids. I never wanted kids. Had I not had my mom not died. You know, 
I don't know. I mean, I would have, I would have had my child, um, but uh, I was actually like happy about it rather than like when I set up. You know, I, I, I can only imagine. You know, before that, I, I probably would have been mortified because mm-hmm. um, I never really got it. I just thought, what a terrible thing to do! Like, why would you want to do that? Kids are annoying. You know, <laughs> um, I, I was more kind of like mm-hmm. a guy in a lot of ways. So. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, uh, I agree with you. And, uh, but about the prior thing, um, you know, I, uh, I will say, as true as it is, I'm really concerned now at what I'm seeing, because I'm seeing uh, flat earth divorced from uh, a belief in, in Christ and the true gospel being saved is, is a disaster. Because if you're unsaved and, like, you're, like, reject the Bible and everything, and you realize the earth is flat, like, it's just like a a one-way ticket to thinking aliens, you know, (laughs) like, aliens created us, and I mean, it's dangerous, like, it's almost to the point where, you know, I don't really push it that much, so I don't think someone's saved, because, um, you know, I didn't realize it until after I got saved, Mm -hmm. I I was totally against it, and within, like, three months, like, when it reoccurred to me after I got saved, and I I remember one day I was full of and I was like, the earth is flat, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And the answer I got is I was like, yep. And that was all it took. And I mean, I confirmed it later, but it was, you know, <laughs> it was just really, it was like a Holy Spirit thing, you know. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of that, finding out things I was wrong about. <laughs> well, let me, let me say, uh, well, I want to say something about parenthood before we move on. I, uh, it's, it's clear that you and I greatly treasure parenthood. We, we know the, the, the great blessing it is in our lives. And uh, I'd like to have everybody be blessed in that way. But uh, obviously, we also know that the Bible does say to, for us to multiply. We are supposed to be reproducing. But on the other hand, we, we also have the Apostle Paul saying that um, oh, yeah. uh, in his case, he, forego, he would forego that so that all of his time could be dedicated to ministry. Because if you do have a spouse and then children, uh, you you have a duty to put a lot of time into that, and you have less time for to, in service to God. So um, and that's God's purpose for you yeah. in that case, and that's different. Like you're not going to be, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, you're not going to be like un, undercooked, yeah. you know, undeveloped. If God, like, you know, if that's His purpose, and you're a believer, and you're actually yeah. doing this for the Lord, I just know the general person, like especially my age today. Mm-hmm. So many. I mean, the most comments I get on a comment I've ever left under a video, like months later, it's just a video where it like it was about you know feminism and you know telling women not to have children. And I just left a comment, very simple, that I then short that I was you know I said that until I was 28, and now you know now I have three kids. So I'm 32, and I would you know that I don't regret it, and it's the best thing I ever did. And you wouldn't believe the comment. Wow. Yeah. People leave. So that's why I was saying that. But no, I certainly don't mean that somebody that devotes their life to ministry or just, or, you know, I mean, it's, it, like I said, if you if you were able to have kids, I, I mean, that's because I believe God didn't mean them for you. But yeah. um, I'm talking more about the people that, you know, well, it was, uh, there's a lot of us that were uh, accused. I'll now tell you, this, uh, this is something that is proven true in, uh, in my life many times. Uh, Um, In my case, it was uh, having children was not one of my life's goals. I never really thought about it or dreamed about being a parent. But when it it happened, I recognized the the greatness of it. Uh, And I saw the same thing happen with some other family and friends that they they never planned on being uh, parents. It wasn't a a goal or a a great desire. But when it happened, they, they also recognized how great it was. So uh, maybe, yeah, maybe that will happen. Yeah, for some of the some of the people who are listening to us now, uh, I don't mean to try to put any kind of trip on on you, but maybe yeah. if you don't have children and then someday you do, you can relate to what we're saying, how great it is. Um, but I will say that there's two two other things that I want to uh, touch on before we finish our, our talk. And uh, okay, so the the um, the I the the experience of the uh, entity, the demon uh, departing. With the prayer, the Lord's prayer, uh, that was the sign that that uh, proved to you 
they're okay there is a god there is something to this and it must be the god of the bible because it's lord prayer at that at, at some point did you go to the bible and begin studying it because oh by the way i also want to say something about that you said you made a little short comment i've never known you to make a short comment <laughs> your your comments yeah if anybody doesn't know if you don't know angel if you ever see any of her text comments on videos they're very lengthy they're very thought thoughtful very thought provoking very well written and so for her i leave a little short comment and that's uh, that's almost hard to believe but i, I believe yeah, I, know. I think i left like a long one also on that video but like the one i get responses to is this short one and there's so many angry females on there and Yeah. They, the, 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 I don't know, some people call it the Jezebel spirit. I don't think that's in the Bible, but you know, it is. It's just that that uh, rebellion, mm -hmm. um, and they just don't want to. They can't stand the idea of ever having to to do anything that's not just for them. Yeah. And I know because I was like that. I was like that. So um, that's why I felt like talking about it. But uh, okay, anyway, so yeah, no, I'm, I'd like to know when, when your Bible study began and how that's progressing. Like, what, how cruel is it to live for such a short time? You 
you know, and love so hard and with a love that demands eternity. You know, and I wondered why did we, why do we fear death so much? And why do we want eternity with the people we love if we never had it to begin with? If we always died. And uh, Genesis answered that for me. And just Genesis was the only thing that ever answered all who didn't have suffered, truly and profoundly suffered, you know, brought to my knees. Um, to even know why people wanted answers to those questions. You know, I didn't even get what people needed to know about whether there was a God prior to that. Mm. I was just so, so, man, I was real smart and real stupid at the same time. And um, since then, um, I have, I've listened, I mainly get to listen to the Bible because I'm always home with the kids uh, all by myself, all three kids, and I don't have any family here. So, um, Bill works and I have kids. Um, all day, and uh, his family, yeah, most of them, I, basically I'm always alone with the kids, so most of what I get to do is actually listen to the Bible, and so I've listened to all of it um, uh, once now, it's a little difficult uh, sometimes to listen to it, because like, I have to go back if I miss something, uh, so now I am, I've been going back to pertinent chapters that I am most uh like drawn to like the things that i remember the most um and then i'll probably start over from the beginning um but i also like to to uh, read psalms before bed at night so um but uh, yeah i uh, i'm right now i'm in matthew and uh which is actually where they're at in the bible study i found out last night but mm-hmm. matthew is you know probably one of my favorite chapters well that's my favorite chapter in the new testament definitely Mm-hmm. But um, I will just say, though, that if, so, Genesis is what did it for me. You know, uh, I don't know if I hear a lot of people saying that, but that is really what did it for me because of no understanding that we weren't created to die and suffer and lose the people we loved. Mm-hmm. And we were, it just, it made everything, it just, it, everything clicked perfectly in the place when I, when I, I read it um, and realized, like, all the things I wish my family had explained to me when I was a kid that they had never really thought about, I guess. Um, you know, we talk about my, I talk, my dad and I talk about it now, but that was, I, I, I've actually also, my, one of my close friends who was a lot like me, um, uh, you know, he, uh, his name's Ben, um, he 100% believes the Bible is true now because I spent two weeks, and I'm not saying I know for sure he's saved, um, but because his first reaction was to say that he was angry, that it was true, because now he realized that he'll never cease to exist, or, you know, and I told him that, that that's debatable, but at the time I was, you know, yeah, I told him that you're, you know, you're eternal, one way or the other, heaven or hell, but that wasn't, um, what, what convinced him was just, uh, just patiently going over every single thing with him and every question. He's very smart and very good at debating. But I just, you know, I had to get through it myself to get where I am now. I heard it all. I know all the objections <laughs> um, from people like me, millennials especially. And, uh, it, you know, I, there is a way to get through to them to where at least they have to realize the Bible it, to disprove it at the very least, you know, because all the things that they'll throw at you, it, you can disprove via the Bible, but I did find that in Genesis, for several people my age, and you know, this was Genesis and explaining that in the creation that really seemed to somehow drive the point home mm. with them, like, and make them see the wisdom of the Bible, which I guess a lot of people will say, oh, start in the New Testament with the Gospel, but it seems like for this Something about Genesis and understanding the creation and seeing it in a different light, where it's not just stupid and doesn't sound like a fairy tale, but it actually uh, it seems to be really effective mm-hmm. at making them. And then, and then that that makes it able to understand yeah. the fundamentals of the gospel. I just didn't. I didn't get like there was too many holes. You know. <laughs> That story. Yeah, that approach I've recommended for, for many years. I've, I've always said, I've always said, start reading, uh, uh, just read the, the Gospel of, of John um, 10 or 20 times. Think about reading anything else from 
Um, I now I realize that uh, for you and for for many people I'm uh, encountering now, particularly if, if they have come to, me, and I this has been a big shock to me because I I never would have believed it, but I know it's true. There are a lot of people now who are coming out of atheism and believing in in uh, the the Bible because they've concluded that the Earth is not a ball yep. and it's a spinning ball. And when they when they believe that that is proven to them scientifically, the the, the shock. Okay, uh, I, I got to now. I got to see the Bible. And when they read and they can see that the, the model as what we find in Genesis um, uh, is, uh, then they instead. So I can. Say, That's a very good point. Matter of fact, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say it the way you just stated that. And I hadn't really thought about it that, that way before either. But it, it is amazing that uh, many people even do come to faith at all anymore because they've been so brainwashed by uh, Darwinism and the universe being so vast. And we're a speck and we're just a meaningless speck of, in this vast thing and of no consequence or significance. That, yeah. You know, so. It, you know, it truly is a miracle every time someone does believe today they're they're so they're, they got yeah. so much against them uh, to ever come into the faith yeah right and it's the, the rules are uh, i feel just from my experience especially with that my friend and her family you know for instance the, there's a lot of consent required um they have a backhanded definition definition of this of consent you know the devil and his demons and also you know his earthly minions um but like the way it was explained to me was that um the reason that even though i grew up in the belly of the beast with a lot of this going on in my hometown uh and i am uh i found out uh bloodline descendant 
of everybody awful. Um, I mean, you can confirm it. I, I, anybody that wants to who doesn't believe me, I'll give you the information. If you press it, you know, just leave a comment under this video. You can look it up yourself. It's really easy to trace me back all the way to Emperor Claudius, who was Nero's um, stepfather. So I'm descended from, from Agrippina, who was also Caligula's aunt, and then through the Merovingians, and so what they call the 13th line, right? And so her, her family wanted to um, program my child, or my children, um, and uh, she did uh, kidnap my child uh, temporarily. We got, we got her back. It was, God was protecting us. I mean, we, we, we tracked them down right before she disappeared behind a door of a house. She had no, like, she'd never been here before, but this was a safe house. Um, anyway, uh, the thing is, though, is that the, the, the consent... Um, there, there's all these like legal rules, this legal wrangling that goes on um, at the, with the spiritual side of things. Uh, and um, from what I can tell, um, my grandfather renounced for, the Freemasons. He was like the blood miner. He renounced Freemasonry in the 37 degree, became a devout believer, and like would never talk about it after that. And um, I do believe he, that was when he was very a young man. He, I think he severed any claim or consent that they could have had on his uh, progeny. Um, uh, because I was not harmed as a child, and my family was clueless, and they did not know what was going on. And I, you know, what, I mean, I spent the night over these people's houses and stuff. Um, and uh, uh, I was always treated weird. There was always this weird saying, like, like, my family was wasting my potential, which I was like four and a great, you know, student, and <laughs> like, you know, well, it, it made no sense. But I got those comments all the time from these people what I later found out to be these people. And uh, it was because they knew about us and um, they thought it was being wasted because I, they weren't programming me and they, <laughs> they weren't allowed to work on me and whatever. And um, what I came to, so when I found out about this and my friend and what she was and what her family was, uh, and I tried to help her, but I let her into the house with my children, that counted as me consenting. I renewed consent because that, because I knew I was given warning, you know, um, that's how they, that's how, that's what they consider consent, because I should have, you know, known not to let her around my children, especially when she told me about my bloodline ancestry, I confirmed it, and then she also warned me and begged me to throw it out because she said that she was programmed uh, to program children, and she uh, had been ordered to by her family, that was the only reason she was actually allowed to come here, she didn't escape <laughs> from the CIA, um, and come here, and you know, uh, that, that they were allowing her, and it was to work on my children, and she was so distraught, and she wanted to kill herself, and I couldn't let throw her out, and I didn't believe that, I couldn't believe that, you know, I just couldn't believe that, but she never harm my kids. Um, but so that's important, I think, for people to understand is this consent thing. So um, I, and the, the way that there's like a legal, there are rules. So somehow I see, you know, I don't know the rules, but the way that I see the devil operate, I recognize that he's avoiding, there's like, he's, he's going through this invisible obstacle course. I can't see the obstacles, but there's no other explanation for his, his movement, if, if that makes sense. So, um, and uh, with the... But the way people have been waking up to the reality of things on mass recently, um, you know, I just reason that uh, it always has to be fair, you know, it has to be fair. And I, I think that, um, you know, with the, the, the less time we have, the, the, the more uh, it's going to come down to, you know, because it says, you know, those who receive the love of the truth. Right? And how, how funny is it that lately, that's what every, you know, people, there's two, two types of people now. There's people that are truthers, and there's people that, you know, are totally asleep, and they call those people conspiracy theorists. And some of those people will become truthers sooner or later, but a lot of them have hardened their hearts, mm -hmm. you know, against these things. Like, they don't, doesn't matter how much evidence you show them, they're just not going to be convinced. They don't want to mm -hmm. believe it. And uh, I think that we'll see that divide more and more. Um, yeah. as the days are shortened, that we will see people that, you know, the truth matters to them, it resonates with them, and they they won't willfully lie to themselves. And then those who, well, they don't mind, they don't mind lying to themselves, you know, and remaining in denial. And well, I guess that's probably what it all comes down to. Are you, so, um, are you ready for my final question of the night? Yes. Okay. Uh, 
Now, I've said this many times. Uh, you may have heard me say it uh, before, but uh, I believe when every person is born again, uh, at that moment in time, their ministry begins. And uh, most people, most believers, uh, they don't even uh, act that they are called into ministry as a believer. And they don't have to do any religious works or ministry works uh, to keep their salvation. It's a privilege and an honor to serve Jesus. But God does have a calling for every one of us. He has a place, a role for us in the body of Christ. And it's, it's a sad thing that many people never learn and recognize uh, what their calling is, their ministry. So my question is, have you uh, discovered what your calling is and uh, and have you begun any, any uh, works in, in ministry or? Well, I mean, so part of that is, you know, right now, like I it might seem like I'm like a talkative person, but it's actually really difficult for me to, I don't like the tension to be on me. Um, I don't like to, um, I, I really don't like to try to express myself verbally because I'm terrible at it. I'm good at writing. Um, but uh, so, like, the, I, I, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what I, what my he uh, has, you know, that he has put in me for the purpose of, you know, ministry. And, um, you know, I'm still, like, at first I was like, should I make a channel? Um, right now, like, the extent of it is, <laughs> and, and honestly, it's pretty effective, um, is that I've been um, trying to reach people just honestly via comments and via my Twitter page, which I have a Twitter, and I, I try to, um, you know, post insights and explanations, and, and, and just that's where it started, because I know writing is one of my skills. Um, I don't know after anything yet. It's pretty difficult right now because I have three children under five. Um, no help. <laughs> um, but uh, the way that I, I feel like that experience with my best friend and this crazy side of things that a lot of people don't ever experience firsthand, I feel like that has to factor in somehow because it's <laughs> it's like you got like my, it's like once the whole story. It sounds like it just sounds like I'm lying, I guess, or like a movie. But you know, I know God put that term, that information. You know, gave me that understanding, gave me that experience for a reason. So I do think that that factors in. I think that um, I don't have a church here. I have not been able to find a church with uh, the correct gospel. Um, it's very unfortunate uh, in my local area. There's a lot of churches. But, uh, you know, I just can't bring myself to go somewhere where, and that's why I haven't been baptized yet, because none of them will baptize you uh, unless you remember um, uh, for a long time and under observation, because they, they think that they can tell whether you really believe by how you behave. Um, and um, so I haven't been, I really wanted to be baptized, but, uh, I, you know, I am still trying to figure that out. It's only been about two years um, for me, and it's <laughs> the first one was real crazy, uh, really kind of coping with what happened here, and my best friend, she was here for a long time, and um, j uh, just wrapping my head around everything, and then I had a, my, my child, um, my my Grace, her name's Grace, uh, by the way, I wanted to tell everyone that it's because of this fellowship, um, I always believed the correct gospel, uh, and I was lucky that way, but um, when I found um, uh, Nene, Luke, and, you know, Messiah, which I had actually watched uh, D13 uh, prior to this, um, that's how I came over to talk in doctrine and found you guys, too. Uh, you guys really made me understand, like, the final aspect that I, that I hadn't fully grasped, which was um, just the importance the, like, nothing I have to say is as important as the actual gospel. Like, that, that, that was the thing. Like, I was I was thinking that I needed to tell people, oh, man, you guys got to watch out for these mics, full space. You know, like, that was, like, the thing that God wanted me to share. You know? And I was, you know, I was missing the point because I didn't really completely understand, like, that people actually believe the correct gospel weren't really saved, even if they, you know, were close enough, you know, like, um... Now, I, I draw the line, basically, when people say that, you know, uh, 
you have to have works of some sort, um, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm a little iffy on people who don't realize they can't lose their, it's their salvation. It depends on how long they've been saved. But the point is, is that there's a lot of people coming to the truth now, and they, they, they're believing the Bible, and they are believing in the death, burial, and resurrection. And I'm seeing it, but so few of them are actually coming to the full understanding of the gospel and resting in Christ. And so that has just been in the past... Um, let's see, so 18 months, I guess, that I've uh, really, really missed that, because, um, well, actually, no, my baby was about to be born. I didn't have a name for her, and I found you guys, and especially, um, uh, after, I think, one of Renee's videos where she, like, just fully laid it out, like, fully laid out the importance of, of resting and why other, you know, why that's just the true gospel and why, it, you know, you can't count people saved if they, even if they believe in work, you know, a little bit and, and all of that. Um, and I realized, you know, exactly what Christ did, you know, washing me in his blood and, um, about me having to rest, you know, completely in Christ. Uh, I named my baby Grace. I prayed for a name. I had prayed for a name for like a couple months at that point, and, um, you know, I, I had a really hard time with girl names. I have all these boy names, but I keep getting girls. And um, so I uh, well, it was part of it. I guess I only had like weeks to go, like maybe like a month or something, when I realized that Grace was the name. And what was interesting was my aunt, she called me the next day and she was like, Angel, I've got a name. You know, and she, <laughs> I was like, what is it? And she, it was Grace. You know, it was just, just, just like, you know, one of those like God incidences, right? You know, the Holy Spirit spoke to her too. But, uh, uh, yeah, so, you know, I am, um, I have oh, quite a bit on my hands. Uh, so at the, I feel completely compelled to talk, to reach people. I mean, I'm not this loquacious and, uh, I guess, articulate for no reason. I mean, I feel like I need to especially reach people that were like me, though. Um, that is my talent when it comes to, um, because, you know, I don't really know what it's like to be like Daniel, where you're raised in the church and you, you know, you believe the Bible and all that, but you haven't, like, you know, you just, you didn't have the, the full assurance or the, you didn't feel safe. Like, I don't relate to, to how to talk to, I wouldn't know how to talk to him out of that. Because that's what, I still don't understand how that happens. Um, but um, I do know how to get over the hurdles and mental walls of people like me. Because I've been there. Mm -hmm. And um, I really do think that that is, if anything, maybe that is, you know, you know why God, you know, went so far to, to reach me. Because I would be effective. Mm -hmm. You know, for right. people just like me, because I was mm -hmm. really sick, mm -hmm. and I was real puffed up, and mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, and I don't know if that's going to come in the form of, like, I don't know the most effective medium of doing that, you know, but uh, for now, I, I try to just reach people online. Mm -hmm. um, the best way for me is in writing, though. Know, I, don't, I don't think I'm quite yeah. useful. Let me, uh, yeah. let me uh, uh, speak on this a little bit, too, because I, I don't want to... I worry that I might be uh, giving people some kind of a guilt trip here by what, the way I said that. Is it? Uh, we have a um, uh, we do have a duty uh, to uh, serve the Lord. Uh, obviously, we're not. Uh, uh, it's not a legalistic system, uh, but it, as I said, it is a privilege. And if we understand the privilege that we're offered, uh, then then uh, we should be excited about doing it. But on the other hand, and you have to realize that um, I'm retired. Uh, you know, I've been retired for 14 years. Uh, so there's, there, there's nothing else requires my time. My son's grown up. He's independent. He doesn't need my time. My wife is here with me. We have plenty of quality time. But I have a lot of time. Someone like, like you and many other people, you're raising your children. You're very busy. You have other responsibilities. So I don't want to give you or anybody else the, the impression that I, I'm trying to impose some kind of a no. work on you as a, for ministry. But uh, if we, I think that we, many of our brethren and sistren, I don't know, that's not a word I don't think, but I like I it. I, I, like, uh, I think that we, um, we haven't recognized that we do have this privilege of serving. And the, and if we do, we'll recognize that that. that is, and we need to then pray and Lord, 
reveal to me how you want to use me uh, within the parameters that, that I have in my life. You know, I, my, ch my children need me, my, my husband needs me, but what can I do within my uh, boundaries? And uh, I will say from my experience with you is that I've said before, and you recognize it as truth, that you are uh, one of the most talented writers I've seen on YouTube. Every time you write a comment, I'm excited to read your comment. You're so articulate. And so I think maybe the written word, you might even end up in your spare time writing a book. And maybe you can ask Jack Smack 77 to help you publish. He's got about 30 books on Amazon now. Oh, that would be awesome. I, I'm sure I he'd help. actually ask him how you actually, like I can write a lot of stuff, but I've always been, it's always seemed very daunting to organize it into a book form. You know, but I guess it's like an editor does that. But yeah, that's, yeah I mean, I, you just have to find like, like, if your heart is filled with this, this, this appreciation and gratitude and this desire to tell other people, you know, it will naturally express itself. Mm -hmm. And also, um, uh, if your time is constrained, it, it, you know, it will, it, it will um, be like, like water escaping from whatever, like, you know, like a hole it can, like it's, it, it'll come out. Mm -hmm like comments and um and things like you know like on yeah. my, my twitter page that's how i can do it right now like that's much, yeah. like realistic but that i think that the, the important thing is having your heart filled to the brim like that where it can't help but leak out now i will say too i was an evangelistic uh little god hater you know growing up i mean i was the type that would try to to convince people to stop believing and probably people like i don't even know if my cousin was saved because he wouldn't have told me you know, he wouldn't have told me because he looked up to me and he wouldn't have wanted to, to get, you know, berated for it. Um, so I really don't know. And um, um, he was pretty young, too. And uh, if I was an evangelistic, you know, antichrist, you know, that's basically what I was, I, you know, I damn sure better be an evangelistic, you know, uh, believer. Mm -hmm. and, I, and that's just my nature, though. Mm -hmm. When I believe something, I'm always determined to convince other people. <laughs> Okay. So I do think it will be inevitable. Let's uh, let's you. finish up by looking at the chat room very quickly here to see if they have any any thought or comment or something that we need to respond to. Uh, anybody in the chat room? If you, I know you got your own conversations going on there too. But uh, for those people who have been listening, uh, is there anything you'd like to say to uh, to us uh, that you want us to respond to uh, to Angel or? Uh, uh, let me see. I do know that you have, I see Soldier for Crisis here, and you're planning on being on his program tomorrow. I think some of the things you touched on tonight, uh, he'll probably want to go into much more detail with you on those things tomorrow. Uh, but, uh, okay, I don't see anything in the chat room that, uh, that we need to answer. So um, let me just close by saying, uh, uh, Angel, uh, you really are an angel. And then you know what angel means, right? Angel just means messenger. And, and so I love it now. Yeah. I love, I love my name now. Yeah. I love it. Like, and, I think it was Providence. Oh yeah. God, me and uh, the word, the word evangelist means Eve. The prefix means good, good message. And ist is deliverer. One who's delivering the good news is an evangelist. So, uh, yeah, it's a wonderful name. And uh, so I appreciate you taking some time out. And uh, I know that I have got to know you much better. And I'm thankful yeah. for that. And uh, I, I hope that the people who listened and also those who people who watch this uh, and listen in the future, uh, now they, they know uh, Angel Martin much better, Sister Angel Martin. Oh, and I appreciate you asking me um, on this. I really do. Um, you are just, uh, I watch every video you make. Just, you just warm my heart. Just, you're just, you are, <laughs> you are just such a, a humble, loving person and you are you just really have your heart and your head in the right place and god is really using you uh especially now that you're retired it's just it's, it's a perfect it's a perfect setup you know and you have really made the most of it and uh i hope to uh you know especially as my time i get more time free time i really hope to be as dedicated as you have shown yourself to be because you've been in this a long time and so i appreciate it and i will try i just i don't have the the internet currently well, we are between, we have very few options out here in the country. Um, so I haven't been in the chats much because it's just a very 
annoying on my phone. I just it constantly takes me out or backspaces what I say. But uh, I should be getting um, a new phone soon. <laughs> my birthday's coming up, and that's <laughs> I said that's what I, I told I told my husband that's the only thing it's worth getting me because I can't use this. Um, and uh, uh, I, I will uh, definitely. Uh, try to be especially in the private fellowship but um uh, i love you all very much and uh, uh yes i will be on steve's show tomorrow um and that should be interesting if you guys want to hear more about the weird stuff that i that i got into and maybe sound crazy for yeah. talking about so briefly yeah <laughs> all so, right so everybody tomorrow uh, tomorrow saturday uh soldier for christ we are at war uh, angel martin will be joining brother steve on on that program so i hope you'll join them there uh, that's, that's 7 p.m. what central or eastern uh, i think eastern okay eastern. 7 p.m. Uh, eastern okay all right so uh, everybody in the chat room all the people in the chat room thank you for being there and listening and also i saw there were some trolls that you you were able to to uh, get rid of so thank you for that and uh uh, Angel, thanks again. Oh, yeah. Thanks, thanks so much. And to all, all the right. viewers, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.